something completely different. Let's, let's go back to this. You guys did think questions on this, these kinds of things. You guys remember this? Uh, basically, uh, on this other quiz, I'll ask you some things like this, maybe change up the, the business. But if you want to look at uh, per pound or per, you know, the, uh, the average weight, the average uh, cost, the average uh, revenue, the margin, those kinds of things. And on this, on this uh, illustration, which, which uses the least capital per unit, unit, all you were looking at is it's already been averaged there. So but we understand how do they get to this average? Is it, you know, they're, they're averaging this into that. They use 48,000 divided by 200,000, 40,000 divided by 200,000, $200 divided by uh, 500 pounds. So uh, cost per pound. And so that, that's an easy question. You're just looking at it. It's already done for you. Which one, which method is the least capital cost per pound? Which is more efficient? We talked about this last week. So if you said which one is most efficient, well, this one's most efficient. That's the same thing. Cost per pound is less, but which is greenhouses or the small gardens well um, this is less than that 24 so that's more efficient and then the question though is why is it more efficient we said what would, what would we say about that why not, what about growing up But this is a, you know, this is a lot more too. <coughs> so they, they put in a, <coughs> excuse me, a lot more cost and a lot more output. But, and so the average is down, even though this is a lot more, it produces, um, produces relatively speaking, a lot more than this. If this is, uh, you know, 20 times and this is uh, 40 times. So, but what was the other part? Oh yeah, so the why are you greenhouses? So this is an I concept. What is a greenhouse? Well, you can do it year round. And, but the thing about the greenhouse is it has startup costs that are really expensive. You know, like to, to build it and to run it, you have a, a heater or an air conditioner or something, you know, humidifier or humidifier, whatever it is. And those are very costly. But the small garden doesn't do in the winter at all. And so you have three months or whatever it is, depending on which, which part of the country, three to six months, it's not producing anything. So it's 40 cents a pound, which is all right, but it only produces that. I mean, you didn't spend much. You don't have to. Yeah, I don't, I don't work in the winter. So you're not living in the winter. Oh, well, I don't live all day. So typically, a question from the book was, why do people even do a small garden then? One of the answers would be what? They, what? They just enjoy doing it. Or also another thing, you know, I'm not been, a, I've been a, a gardener, but you know, he, it was a, I'm not very efficient on it. So I don't really know personally, but so I've read a lot about gardens and farms and things. And, and what I've learned is that people enjoy them, but also if you, he said here's the cost per pound but then but then uh and here's the here's here's what it costs to do it and this is what you produce and this is what it you know, so this is what it costs to do it but what can you sell it for you know this is not the profit this is just your cost so then you sell it and let's say 50 cents you know so i don't know what what hey, wait, it's not on here so 50 cents a pound or a dollar a pound you know, if you have, if you have two hundred thousand of them, you can, you can. It's like a real business, like, and you can have a real price. But over here, you just have five hundred pounds in a year. Maybe that's not really enough to really sell to anybody. Nobody's going to buy like you know from time to time something from somebody. Typically, like, I don't know. Maybe they do. Uh, people, like, you know, in your neighborhood, you know who it is. You know, from time to time, we have eggs for sale. You know, I've seen that, but I don't, it's not like, 
you always go there for eggs. And so that's a part of it. So, but what is the revenue and the profit? Sometimes it's, it's skewed either that this is more efficient or that. So sometimes a small garden could actually sell this for more, knowing that it's your your aunt or your neighbor that's producing uh, really great fruits and vegetables, like really, really nice tasting. He, she does it, and it's, it's not her business, but she does it. And she could sell like a, a really big, nice t- tomato for like $3 or something, who knows. And they couldn't do that, you know, because people go there as a business, so they have to have low prices and there's competition. And there's really no competition with a small car. So they can have a big old price. So that's part of it. Remember that if you have a sort of a concept, you're thinking, like, think through the whole thing. Don't think, let's get this quiz over with. <laughs> think, speculate. Give me something I've never heard. Something like, he didn't say this in class, I didn't read this. I've always thought, put it down. Everything is negotiable. Everything is, it's not like this is all there is to learn. You know, there's always new concepts. And you could be a, a cutting edge of, of an idea. <laughs> so, since large farms are more efficient than greenhouses, and so how do greenhouses stay in business at all? Well, that's like what you answered there. They, they can stay in business all year round. So, they might charge really high prices in the winter, for example. Their, 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 their revenue and their prices, do their costs, but their prices can be really high. Small garden can do a high price because it has a very good taste and you know it's gently made or, you know, it's with, uh, you know who did it and they're not fertilizing it with poisons and things or, or who knows. Um, or, and then and the greenhouse can charge high prices because they have no competition. Also, they might not have a competition. So, and also, it's during, let's say, February, and you're in Minnesota. Like, wow, what a tomato. Like, this is awesome. So, and, and you can get them from Colombia. Well, all, all of this being farmed, if it's vegetables and fruits, of course, there's a problem with competing with South America. South America, in North America, South America has um, more year-round fruits and vegetables. That's why we get bananas and all those things comes nightly by plane from those places. And it's cheaper. It's actually cheaper than doing it here. So those are some things. Always you're always thinking of the cost, revenue, efficient, efficiency. What is so that's that's usually known as the profit margin. Most profit margin Net profit margin, net income, all of those are synonymous. And that, that says efficiency. And that's, you know, at the very beginning, we said, what, are, what is an economist trying to do? He's always trying to think, what is the most efficient way? It's been a very long time, and I had a good idea for the first time. And my thing was we were doing the dishes, like putting dirty dishes into the dish, what's it called? <laughs> the dish, dishwasher. The dishwasher. <laughs> I'm such an expert. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know what we ought to do <laughs> is put all of the forks and the spoons all in the same thing, you know, in the same little slot in the dishwasher. And I was thinking that was efficient because when you, you when you take them out, you don't you know, just, I mean, then you have to put them, sort them, unless you're like in college, you just put everything in one thing. <laughs> just, just, but, you know, normal civilized places you have forks and spoons and knives and you know and so you take them out of the dishwasher all the I, I grab all the forks and just put them all in the forks all the spoons efficient you know i'm saving 10 seconds <laughs> something like that and my wife said yeah good that's efficient Let's be efficient. and that's what you learn in business school is you're a man, in management, or in economics, accounting, it's all about efficiency. Management is like that. How to be efficient. How do you, you know, brush your teeth? I always do this. I, I walk around, around my house. I'm brushing my teeth for four minutes. I have this little thing. I just for four minutes. I'm going to do this curtain. I'm going to do my pillow. 
all doing all this stuff that I don't know knows what I'm sometimes I'm doing stuff like this. I don't do But if I'm sitting in the bathroom, so I'm trying to be efficient. I'm always, I'm not efficient, but thinking like an economist. Does that make sense? So when you answer these questions, think, you think about stuff like this. You like it. Yeah. I have a lesson on efficiency. You go for it. Without uh, your once, math. Please. Apparently, yeah. once a company gets so much money, they start to not care anymore. <laughs> I arrived at the Starbucks. That's literally what you can see down the road. I arrived there about 20 minutes ago. I already ordered online and paid, and then I got there too. And it was packed. Yep. I mean, it just didn't. It wasn't there. It was oh, like twenty minutes. To get. So you just still waited even. Yeah, I just, I just waited. Yeah, and you pay. If you pay, so what were they thinking? They're thinking something. What do you think? I'm thinking where it's the not that. Well, you're sure mad. I, I know. But here we are, third party. We're kind of removed from it. What do you think they're thinking? Why did they not do it right? But why did they have it ready? So you think they're, they're evil? They were holding me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's paid. I'm not gonna fix it. <laughs> they thought they were being efficient. They were like over efficient. They became inefficient. They thought they were being really efficient. You know, how they, what were they thinking? Right here, the ice Maybe something like that. Like they didn't want you to be watered down when you got there. They make it too early. They didn't, they wanted it to be perfectly right as you get there, but they estimated the wrong time or something. Like, oh, here he is, make it. That was lame. But they need to be, but they, they weren't thinking like Mr. Uh, Turner, like, he got his money. Let's get out of here. The manager, we still to see him. I love that. We can do anything. Get out of here. <laughs> okay. Uh, remember this question. Somebody explain, like, what goes through your mind and you're thinking to answer this question. Wasn't this one of your explain think questions? And no answer. Miss Phillips, was this one of your questions? What goes through your mind when you said, when, that, when the question was something like this? Which is it case one or case two that is more efficient to use the machine? What goes through your mind when you're looking at this? Like without your mask for a second. What is cheaper? It's cheaper than what? The people. Than the people. Yeah, so 210000 to use a machine and 240000 to do the same amount of work, either with a machine or 10 people. And so it's cheaper in case two to use the machine. So you just don't think, I don't, I don't even, I've never heard of this. I don't, how am I supposed to memorize this? <laughs> that would be an immature student. Mature students say, I got this on every single question. That's what you first like. Okay, what is this? I'm like, what is this? I got this. Don't think. I didn't study. Don't think like that. There's no studying. It's mine. You have the mind of Christ. And it's a lot better than mine. Okay, so about this job efficiency. Okay, who does the furniture the best? Adams. Who does the chicken the best? Adams. Who does teaching the best? Why do we even need Bolin and Corelli? <laughs> well, that's right. He is the most efficient, and that, so he's the most efficient at all the tasks. So he has what? An absolute advantage. Adams has the absolute advantage. But they are all working sort of together somehow, doing these things. <laughs> and so we know that Bolin has a comparative advantage in chicken and Corelli teaching. Okay, so one way of looking at this, one way of like, okay, so you can see that because of the numbers. Well, what do you think? So what if, if they were in this business, what kind of tasks would they do? Like, what would you say? Just 
you're real basic. What what should they do? How should they divide up their their, their time? Uh, and then they will be the most efficient. You wouldn't just say, Corelli, you know, go home. You know, because he he could be put to do do something. Now there are some times where they're a little babies or something like just just get out of the kitchen. We would be better if they just weren't here. That's what I'm told sometimes. Like, I, like I'm helping doing the thing, like no, no, go, go do the garbage. We're trying to do something here. I don't know, I'm sometimes you're just so inefficient because they have to, they have to teach you how they're doing it. That's inefficient. And that's what happens when you say, hey, I want to work at Chick-fil-A. Hey, for $15 an hour. Like, and so those people are like, why don't they hire me? They see like, this is me in trouble. But I have to pay him to be in the way for a little while. But maybe he's really efficient. So they have a sit down interview with you like, okay, what would you like to do? Nothing. You're right now thinking, I don't think I want this guy in the kitchen. You know what? Oh, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, do this and this and this. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to work here. I'm trying to be an engineer. I'm working with my dad for doing this. You know, okay. So you can have some experience. Okay. So I'm willing to throw away like $300 on you while you're learning. Yeah. Does Chick fil A like do the system? If it works at Chick fil A, at least one of you. Whoa, yes. there's some Chick fil A people. Yeah, All right. right. Chick-fil-A mess. <laughs> like, don't, don't they just keep you in like one station instead of just having you? You rotate? Do you like rotating? No, but there are some people that just stick in one thing. Yeah, right. like one ice cream Miss Rogers, how long have you worked at Chick Fil A? Eight months. Wow. So you, have you been in a lot of different tasks? Yeah. What did you start at? Well, they wanted you to learn everything, but I mean, like, what was your first time where you're like, I'm going to do this for a little while for a few weeks? What? Taking orders. Oh, well, you'd be good at that. But you're not doing that now? No, I still do that a lot. Yeah, that's impressive. what you'd be good at. Uh, but you do like rotating. Yeah. Well, some people like to just do one thing and stay out of the way. Just doing this. Yeah. Oh, why is that? Lifeguard, guarding lines. Yeah. Oh. Because you need to be ready. Yes, I have some. And so, where do you go? So, 15 minutes watching, and then what? We walk. Oh, to the next. So you're just moving, constantly moving. And so you're not looking at, oh, these people aren't doing anything. There's four guys and they just put those off. And so you start thinking that nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. It keeps you from not zoning out. Yeah. Is that interesting? No, it doesn't always work. Well, yeah. Okay, so, so, uh, you know, one way of also looking at this, using those numbers, is, is you could add up all that and average it. That's one thing. You could, you could average this, you could average that, each line, each column. And that's a way to look at it. You could, you could come up with a, a theory about that. See, what could you, I mean, what are these numbers? It's just sort of like efficiency number, co uh, coefficients or something. Okay, so. Uh, something that you need to know, uh, maybe at the bottom of that chapter seven efficiency outline. Chapter seven efficiency outline uh, is the thing about protectionism and tariffs. Now, speaking from Hayek and Mises and Sowell um, and Friedman's standpoint, the Austrians, uh, Chicago school. But look at this. This is a little bit dated, about 15 years ago. But the concept works. I should have one decently because we've had some high tariffs on Chinese certain goods from China uh, lately, last two or three years. For example, on um, what are those things called solar panels, steel, things of certain 
items that we tax really heavily that come from China. Okay, so look at this illustration that goes back to um, uh, 10 years ago or so. Steel manufacturing industry. Over here on the left is the employment, how many people are actually employed in that industry that makes steel. Okay, in hundreds of thousands. So if you go back 40 years, it was 500,000 people, and most recently it's about 150,000 people. 150,000 people, Americans, work directly in the steel industry understand they have a job they're making steel in a factory they're in a company that does something with it's, it's making manufacturing steel 150,000 people you understand a lot of people but if you put 150,000 in one place it'd be a stadium like it would be like a really big football game that's possible to I mean, 120 go there or something, so 150,000. Okay, but it's not that many, see, it's just a football stadium. Okay, on the right, this illustration is what do those people get paid? Well, the wages have gone up. So an average person is, uh, an average worker in the steel industry gets 70 plus, 70 to 80,000 dollars a year. Good wage. Okay, you got that? That was basic, okay. Now, some other things. Here's GDP and world. So we had a real bad worldwide recession in 2008 and nine. It was really started at seven, but this is nine, we're still recovering. Okay, so, but you know, then it's recovered. And you know, the, if, you, if you went to 16, 17, 18, nine, uh, of course, 2020 was like this, you know, but the others are much higher. So the 2021 is probably going to be six uh, percent in the United States. It's going to be this year, 2021 is going to be one of a record year. You guys are looking for jobs. There should be jobs. Yeah. So anyway, here's steel demand because of the because of world economic growth. There's steel demand. In fact. Uh, President Biden just uh, has proposed uh, two trillion dollars of, of spending. The government's going to spend to pay companies to build up infrastructure, roads and bridges and buildings and things, and uh, and they're going to need a lot of steel. And, and so it's going to be really booming. And um, so that steel demand is. Been going up in 2021. It's gonna, it's gonna go, it's gonna go up above it. Anyway, so, so, has to do with the economy. The people don't buy steel products unless the economy is doing strong. You don't want to, you don't want to build a bridge. You don't want to build, put steel into big equipment, into build big weapons and things like that, into things unless the economy is strong. So steel is usually a cyclical. I mean, it's like a cycle. It, it, when the economy is strong, steel is strong. When the economy is weak, steel kind of goes down. If people are not building new buildings and, and things that uh, have a lot of steel in them, um, unless, they, unless they feel like it's, a, it's worth the investment. See, some companies will not build a new warehouse or a new building if their business is probably not going to be growing. So the economy grow, it looks like it's going to grow. The government says, we're going to help you grow. So then people start spending on steel. And then the steel industry starts doing better as an industry. People get paid more, they work in there. So people get more people employed. Okay. Steel starts to work too, so you got to pay welders. So yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you would be, uh, a welder would be a related job. Unless you were actually working in the manufacturing of the steel, they have welders that do the manufacturing. Uh, because you got to manage, you know, it's not like you just have a whole bunch of slab of, of you know, of steel. You have to put it into beams. You have to put it into pipes. You have to put it into devices of some sort. You know, little 
hinges, and all kinds of things. You can weld them like crazy. So if you, if you were a, a welder, it would be yeah, there's a lot in the related industries, but the, but the direct steel manufacturing, a welder is typically in that. Okay, so uh, we've had two presidents lately. They're both Republicans, and they had high tariffs. Bush was one, the second Bush, and Trump. And if you go back, uh, if you remember from United States history, some of you guys did you guys uh, class, and we talked about about 100, 100 years ago, roughly, the Republican Party was for high tariffs. The Democratic Party was for low tariffs 100 years ago. Then the politics through, like, from 1930s and 40s and 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, like that, it switched. The Democrats were for the high tariffs, and the Republicans were for the low tariffs. Okay, but now it switched back. Republicans, well, the last two Republican presidents have been for tariffs, and the Democrats, Clinton and Obama and uh, Biden, are not for tariffs. So it's, it switches around. Politics is funny about on, on, on this. And reason why, just I don't want to. Get, it's a nuanced answer to that. It's not. It's not. An easy answer. Why? Is, why is that? But presidents and government who is for tariffs. The reason why they're for tariffs is because they want to protect. They want to protect jobs for the for the people who are laboring in the steel. Uh, if there's a, if it's a steel tariff. And so politically, a hundred years ago, that was a, that was. That was Republicans. Then it became Democrats, and now it's kind of becoming Republicans. Who works? Who is a steel worker? Okay, those people need to be protected. And how many people work in that industry? About 150,000. So that's something to remember 150,000. So this is an awesome scoop. I, I, I'm going to test you my theory out on you. Okay, so we have 150,000 that work in that industry. And so the protective tariff would protect their jobs, businesses they work for. And so President Bush put in a major uh, tariff, an increase in the tariff of steel that's coming from other countries. And look what happened. In California, the jobs, the number of jobs that grew or was reduced, they were reduced by this level in the major steel producing states, California, Texas, Ohio, all the big states where they produce the most steel. There is a definable, a very data-driven answer, result. The tariffs were supposed to protect people's jobs, but it reduced the jobs. They lost. 10 of the major states. Okay? In the agriculture tariffs, this is what's happened lately in the last 50 years. This, this, this right here is the nominal trade, importing and exporting of agricultural products. This is awesome. Like we export, we import, well, like we were talking about fruits and vegetables from South America, Israel. We send wheat and stuff to Europe. Wheat, corn, fruits and vegetables we send to Japan. Okay, so in the steel industry, it's very, very cyclical. Agriculture is more constant. Fruits and vegetables are coming into the United States and depending on the situation, they'll put a tariff on them there's high tariffs on agriculture. The average price increase for like a banana is to put another five cents a banana. If we, if we didn't have the tariff, a banana might be five cents less. Than it. it is. You, I eat a banana. I eat two bananas every single day. So, Ten cents a day. How many days in the year? How many dollars is that? Thirty-six. Do you want? Do you want that money? I want that money. 
I live a long time. Especially if you have your hands. Who, who gets a haircut in here regularly? I mean, yeah. Everybody but me. <laughs> this hairdo right here is um, my wife. It's a deck. And how much time? Bring me in and claw and cut my hair. Never paid anybody to cut my hair. I've lived. I have saved thousands of dollars. You think, yeah, but look bad the whole time. But maybe so. Is it worth it now, though? Like right now, do I wish? I wish I had paid $5,000 to somebody all those years. Do I wish, like, hey, it's like the wage of management. You never did pay for all those haircuts. Oh, yeah. Here's the bill, $5,000. I sure was worth it. Like, that's. <laughs> No, do I want, do I, am I glad? You know, I got married. Yeah. Like, who am I impressing? I got jobs. I have friends. I never, nobody's like, ah, the haircut. The car. And behind my back, maybe, but anyway, it's a long time ago. Pay attention, <laughs> gentlemen, once you get married, let it all up. <laughs> no, 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 she doesn't. I said, well, then, yeah, I mean, but so, we're talking about efficiency here. You want to save the money? It all depends. You want the vaccine? Do it. Don't. Don't. You want uh, haircuts all the time? No. You'll save some money. You need one haircut? No, I just can't stand it. I've got that. Okay, that's you. There's a lot of people like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Girls do it more often than guys. I want to have a really nice car. I don't want a used car. I mean, you like that. I don't want a used car. I've only had a used car. Except for one. I had one brand new car. You still look for <laughs> I don't know what happened. It was good. It lasted a long time. Oh, I wrecked it in Poland. So, uh, so it was awesome. So, but other than that, so that's just me. It's not like the, the thing to do. Uh, you want a new house? I mean, you guys live in new houses. Like your mom, like we're having a new house. You know, we've lived in bad houses or used houses all this time. And we want a new house finally. You know, something like your grandparents might have done that. Like, You've always gone to their house, and then when everybody got old and everybody moved away, like they, look, we got a new house. It's kind of small. Some people do that. Like, everybody's different. That's awesome. I, I want to say five cents on a banana. I would like that. I mean, why are we taxing bananas? Or it's actually not bananas, because bananas don't even grow in the United States. But it would be a bad, bad example. Um, uh, uh, something like tomato. A tomato. I don't want to something, you know, something where there's a where there's a choice. Question. Yeah, go ahead. You talk about um, like we talked about how Japan has nothing. They absorb a lot of like and stuff. Basically, yeah, hardly any natural resources. What are they, do they have any tariffs? Because I'd imagine like with all the spending they, that they're doing, they'd have to have like at least something. Well, that's a good question. I don't know enough about it. I imagine they got a few tariffs, but I wouldn't imagine too many so that people would actually at least. Yeah, so that's a very good question, and it's, it's a mature question because, like, what do they do? Uh, they have no natural resources. They have no steel. They have no iron. But they have one of the best steel industries in the world. They don't have the natural resource, so they come to the United States and get our raw material, and they bring, take it back to Japan and make it into cars that are sold around the world. Whether they make the cars in Alabama or Hong Kong, so that's. That's using, you don't, so there was a question, does the country have to have the natural resources to be prosperous? No, but you have to have something. You have to have some comparative advantage. You might not have that in Japan. Have. So when we talked about the factors of production, there's capital, remember this? There was labor, what were the other factors? It's an early question on the final exam. What are the five factors of production? There's capital, there's labor, entrepreneurship, we, we just said natural resources, information, yeah. Okay, so what does Japan have? They have capital, they have labor, oh, they have entrepreneurship, and they have information. They just don't have natural resources. That I mean, just broadly speaking. What does the U.S. have? 
We have entrepreneurs like crazy. We're number one right here. Not necessarily homegrown Americans, but immigrants that come to us and then they then they become Americans. I mean, you know, a lot of Indians, a lot of Chinese, a lot of English, a lot of people from Ghana and everybody, they come to the United States and they become entrepreneurs, or they're already entrepreneurs. That's why they came to our country. And why did they come to our country to be the entrepreneur? Because our government and our country prides itself on protecting what? Intellectual property. And that's what entrepreneurs are good at. They have an idea. I can do this. You do a chicken sandwich with a piece of bread and bacon or whatever, and it's like no bones. Who will eat it? <laughs> You're going to charge for that. Three bucks. For a piece of chicken. Yes. I can get, I can get Kentucky Fried Chicken and a whole thing for $10. You get 12 bones or something. But this is different. If it, 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 it's a sandwich, you can got a one sandwich. This is, I'm, I'm, this is what people thought 40 years ago. I don't know. Without bones, what did they do? They took the bones out. What, in a factory? It doesn't taste great. It doesn't sound like it. And then, and then on the way home, you go to a coffee shop. Okay, well, like what? A coffee shop? Like at Firestone? Like at the tire store? No. I don't know, like really good coffee. How good? Like they make it like, yeah, they're making it all day long. Like it's always fresh. Like what else do they do? <laughs> and people go there. I remember, now this is me. And you would go there like, hey, what are you going to, what is it, a dollar a coffee? No, it's $5. There's no way I'm going to a $5 cup of coffee. I can, I can make a whole, I can make a month's worth for five dollars a coffee. Like one for five? No, this is going to be good. Like it's on the go. You're going to go in there like, and they give it to you, like fun, you know, like get the order in and everything, just walk in there, walk out. That's, that's part of the Apparently plan. not. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> not. <laughs> Apparently not. But that's what makes it like, is that worth it now? Like, I spent more money to get it. <laughs> you still I paid it. it. I paid the first hand money because she had points so she could order it online. And I didn't get the points. And I gave her more money. But you drank it. Like now you go back like, this was awful. Yeah, it's not worth it. But look at you had it, you finished it. Yeah. <laughs> now the story's kind of lame. You finished it. You should have kept it. I finished it angrily. Oh, it's very, <laughs> I was I Okay, so the U.S. has, do we have capital? Yeah. Where is the head of the, the, the stock exchange in the world? Yeah. London and New York. That's where capital is created. New York stock exchange and the bond traders, they're making money out of nothing. We have labor, we got all kinds of people. We have natural resources, yes, we have information. Like, okay, then you put up here Ghana. Do they have capital? No. Do they have labor? Yeah, but they have a ton of people. <laughs> but they don't, you know, this is kind of, what are you trying to do? Make a Chick-fil-A. I mean, they can they can do the roof. Can be trained to sell the stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, a little check mark. Entrepreneurs. Yes. Natural resources. Some. Some things. Yes. Information. No. They still think the Japanese won in World War Two, you know, something like that. They're just information is not there. So, just looking at it like that, which is great country. Oh, man, how do they do that? They're almost equal, and they don't even have this. That's because this is awesome. Okay, so back to the, back to our thing. Most favorite MFN, MFN, the most favored nations. We have our favorite nation, and they are the ones that get the lowest tariff. Look what they, what they, what we tax. Peanuts coming from other countries. So if a peanut comes in at 10 cents, or you know, a pound that comes in for 20 cents, we put a 100% plus tariff on it, so now it's 40 cents. So nobody's gonna buy peanuts from another country. What are they doing? They're protecting peanut farmers in Georgia, and then in the South. Why, why are they doing that? Why do we need to do that? We used to make more peanuts than we need to do it. Yeah, 
It's politics. Whenever there's a tax, like, why do they do that? So, think. So, is is a tariff a tax? Yes. But is a tax politics? Yes. Remember that. And they'll they'll tell you that it's for to protect these people. But okay, so let's get to the philosophy of this protectionism at the bottom of your outline. Here's the philosophy. I'm gonna try to brainstorm here. Philosophy. We're gonna we're gonna just get down to just loving the wisdom on all all angles of this. Okay. The philosophy of, of protecting jobs. Why should why should the government want to protect these hundred and fifty thousand steel workers? Why protect them? Let's just fill this room with knowledge. Why protect them? They're Americans. A hundred and fifty thousand Americans work in the steel industry. Because it makes what? They want to protect American jobs. They want to protect American jobs. And there's 150,000, that sounds like a lot. And so why protect American jobs? That's the purpose of the government. This is America. Okay, so they're American, so you don't want to protect, you know, we're trying to protect America. Now, so because it's the United States, you want to protect U.S. citizens. Okay. And by protecting their jobs, these 150,000 people have a job and they get paid well. We said it's 70 to $80,000 a year just to get it be in that, just the average, you know. And so that's good. And so what do they do with their money? What do these Americans do with their money? They save it, they spend it, they get it to people, and be part of the economy, right? And so, so. But let's look deeper in philosophy. I think Socrates here, not politics, not government, not U.S. Why should the government want these people to have a good life? Because what? Oh, well, then, oh, well, maybe they'll vote, but deeper than that, it reflects. If the American people are happy and are living in health, then it reflects on the American self. Okay, so you're saying about an emblem, but let's go deeper. Okay, yeah, so it reflects on that, but if the American, if, uh, if our society is healthy, socially, economically, you know that, um, that's good. Is it that good? Like, is it good that I am healthy? Yes. Because then you're healthy. And if we're healthy, we're not sick. <laughs> That's good. Why is that good? Because healthy people are productive. What's so great about being productive? Then you can save money and give money and be productive for other people. If we were all unproductive, we would all be poor. And if we're all poor, we would all just be pitiful people. But if we're productive and prosperous, then we can help other people. Okay, so 150,000 people are now productive and happy and are able to spread prosperity, right? They have money in their pocket. Ah, they have money. You know, this is about money, too, because it's not that money is the happiness, but it's just the practicality. If I have money, money helps me. And I can help somebody. Like, you might not be in love with money, which would be good be a lover of money, but um, and so yeah, it. Well, but it's, it's easy to say, I don't love money, so I'm not going to work. Well, if you don't work, you won't have money. <laughs> if you don't work, you won't have that luxury. It's a luxury to say, uh, I love just giving my money. You have to have the money. You have to be productive. What's like the okay. parents' philosophy where it's like, spend one third of your life with like, Oh, yeah. Parents. That's like Andrew Carnegie. Uh, so oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, that's right. Well, that's I should have you guys yeah. So, 150,000 people are happy, productive, and they are able to have a family and those people, all that. Okay, but, okay, so 
they put a tariff on steel coming from China or whatever. And so what happens to the price of steel? It goes up. So, so what they do on the steel, steel tariff, price goes up. The reason why the price will go up because the reason why the price is not going to go Mr. Turner said because they just got a jacket to them. It's because the reason why there's a tariff at all, like I think you were philosophically asking that question about peanuts. It's like, why do you even have that? We have so many peanuts anyway. Because somebody can bring those peanuts in. Somebody in Colombia or somebody can produce a peanut cheaper than in Georgia. So they're making sure do not buy from out of the country. You've got to buy American peanut. So you're protecting the industry, the peanut industry. So there's something, there's hundreds of 1,500, maybe that's 300,000, I don't know, maybe it's 50,000 people. It's probably less, I would think it's less than the peanut industry than the steel industry. But for some reason, our government has said, you're not bringing peanuts in here. Now, avocados, it's only 11. Brussels sprouts, it's 14. These are high, though. These are high prices. Cut it off, save some money. It's hard. To, so we, basically, you and I are eating American these things. Most likely. Yeah. That's right. So if, if we looked at a comparison here, just just in this, let's say the United States, the price for steel is $100. And let's say uh, in the uh, UK, just to make it sort of generic here, something you don't have any problems against politically, you have the British, and their price is $99. You know, if you could transport it into the if you Bring it to Alabama, it costs $100 a piece of steel. The UK, $99. They're very, they're very uh, industrious there in steel, UK. But let's, let's put it, let's make it a little bit more realistic and say Japan. We know that Japanese produce Japanese cars in Alabama better than Alabama people produce American cars in Alabama somehow. Okay, so here's the thing. U.S., it costs $100. To ship in a Japanese, this is a Japanese steel, it would cost $99. Which one would most people prefer? Japanese. Why? It's lower price. Okay? Now this is this is these numbers aren't exactly right, but relatively speaking, it is like this. It's cheaper. Japanese steel is cheaper. Why does Japanese do? Because Japan can sell they don't have any of those resources, but they sell steel all around the world and produce Honda cars in Alabama with Japanese steel that they import and pay a tariff. And they're still cheap. So anyway, so here's the thing. There's a steel tariff. With the steel tariff, the United States, I mean, without the steel tariff, the U.S. product is $100. The Japanese product is $99. Most people would say, this is better, it's cheaper. Is it the same quality? It's the same? I'm going to go with the cheaper one. Okay, but there's a steel tariff. This tariff comes in here with, let's say, 500. So the Japanese product is now 104. Now which one do you want? Now we want the U.S. So it's not really a monopoly, but I appreciate the sentiment there. It's not a monopoly. You don't have to do it. But it's really hard when the quality is pretty much the same and the prices are different. It's, not, it's kind of like a sneaky monopoly. That's right. And so it's like, look, you can do whichever one you want. Yeah, but you just rigged it so that I don't want that one. Yeah. You see? Okay, so in this case, why did our government do that? Politically, they say we're saving a job. And you say, 
What's so great about those jobs? They're Americans. Those people are gonna, if, if we just don't have this tariff, you know what's gonna happen? Here's the, no, so here's the point. If we don't have the tariff, politically, this is what they say politically. If you don't have that tariff, people are going to buy the Japanese product. And what's gonna happen to these products? They won't be bought. What's gonna happen to these jobs? They're gonna be gone. Because they won't have any business. They'll, they'll lose, I mean, it'll slowly go out. And the, and the jobs, the, 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 the production will go down because they don't need to produce. Their competition is winning the job, winning the, uh, the sales. So their sales will go down. They'll try to cut costs. And the only thing they can do is cut costs. They can't produce more. They, if it's producing more, you, that price is not going to be good, so they have to cut costs. If they, if they can cut costs, then they could possibly reduce this price to 98. And now where do you want that? Okay, now it's a price thing. This is what every business has to deal with. Or you do a slightly different product, like Chick-fil-A has its own specific thing. And it's not the same as Saxby. It's not the same as Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's all slightly different. And so they have their own little niche. But in steel, you know, the, you know, I'm sure there's some niche, but it's basically like you got a plank of steel, you know. And um, so you understand. So they could reduce their cost, but it, this makes it sort of politically a little bit. It's definitely easy politically. You just say we're putting a tariff of five cents, five dollars, and the Japanese product is higher, and people will then buy American products. But if they took off the steel tariff, I think that the United States would become more efficient to compete. If they want to, they would be more efficient, and they will reduce their costs, and they will get the price down. But politically, what they do is the steel companies do this. Hey, government, we're hurting. Do this. Thank you. And they got a little special favor. And you do that. You're asking that. Go to the government and say, hey, go up to my competition. Put a price of five cents on everything. You know? Like Mr. Turner, like, you can go to the government, the KIB or somebody, and say, hey, every, everybody who's uh, an electrician, everybody that builds houses, tack on $10 on that, on every little thing that they do. And so Mr. Turner, his father, he, just, he has the lowest price of every, uh, you know, he has the lowest price because he jacked up everybody else's price. So, can you do that? You can't do that. Well, how do they get to do that? Well, it's politics. It's a big time thing. Okay, so here's the thing. But here is what we're dealing with. What we could have is this 99. But what would happen if you did this no tariff? Here's what would happen. Here's what. This is, the, uh, this is what Von Hayek would say. This is what Milton Friedman is saying for all these years. No tariff. These guys will benefit. Watch. No tariff. They're lower. You cut costs. Get more efficient. Instead of relying on the government, they'll be efficient. And they'll be, uh, they'll have more long-term benefit rather than just having the government protecting you. So then they will be forced to come, they will be forced to drop their price. And then they will be forced to drop their price. Now who is benefiting? Everybody benefiting, ex maybe except for the 150. So here's the thing. Protection is helping Americans. But you have to ask, how many is it helping? Well, we know specifically it's helping 150,000. That's good. And how many people live in our country? 300 million people. Wouldn't it be good if we had lower prices on things? Like car prices went down instead of straight up? The reason why is because we're putting tariffs on steel and aluminum and rubber and all these things. And what it does is it protects U.S. factories and the jobs. We could be getting at lower prices, which would help. So we're protecting these people 
so that they will have more money in their pocket. But what about the 300 million people that you could be helping with putting more money in their pocket? You see, it's philosophy, but it's economics. You see, the politics gets in there and says, don't look at that. We're protecting these people. You know, now Mr. Trump was famous for doing it on the, on the Chinese, on steel. The reason why that, that was a different thing because it's a little different when you say Chinese. We're going to drive up the Chinese price to, the, you know, let's say they were at 90, but we're going to put a 20 on them. Like, nobody's going to get that. He went in there politically. Mr. Trump, Republican, said, we're going to do this tariff right here. And it doesn't have to do with this. It, yeah, this is this is part of it. But he's saying, you know what they're doing? Now you need to know this. This is part. This is in that chapter, uh, chapter six and seven, where it says, when could you, when could you allow the government's greater role in this? And that's when countries like China are stealing our intellectual property. They're going in there and stealing, hacking, and they know it. They know. They know they're dead to right, stealing all of our patents and all of our copyright and all of those things. Everything in it, internet technology, rocket technology, um, steel technology, building airplane technology, cars, electric vehicles, all that stuff is totally stolen from the United States. Totally. And everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. And so he's like, they've been stealing from us? Stick it to them, you know. However, he said, it. <laughs> and so, and the Chinese like, don't tell everybody, and they're scared to death of that. And, and Biden is probably going to keep it going. He won't say it like that, but he's keeping it going. I'm not going to say it into their face. They have to came with somebody like Trump, and then he gets out, and everybody like, how do we have that thing? I mean, the Chinese. And also, all that they're doing to their own people and all that stuff, all that communist stuff and all that, it's just like, this, they're, they're, you know, they're a rival at best. They're not, they're not a friendly country. Okay, but if we could get it at 90, that, that would be awesome for our, our whole uh, society. But understand that this part of China has to do with something completely different than Japanese or not. Not as much stealing our intellectual property. You understand that? That's what I admit. Yeah. I remember the day that like the tariffs were going to be started because I had a friend and his dad is like uh, in a pretty successful furniture business. And he also had a cool friend. He was friends with a bunch of successful furniture business guys. All of them got imports from Vietnam. And I walked into his house hanging out with his son. He was having a day. And all of a sudden, oh, I no. their prices. What? <laughs> all three of them were like freaking. So they were going to have to buy them locally, which is going to be higher, which is hard for us to understand. Like, you're going to pay higher in Alabama? Well, temporarily, it would be higher. And what what needs to happen is work on our side. Don't just protect them like this is the only price. We can't go any lower. Well, you know, you can't, that, like, every industry has to deal with prices. Apple and Samsung and all, they're always dealing with prices. You don't just get to lock in your price forever. You understand? So, okay, watch this. This is a, this is, this, 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 hopefully not too many flaws. But this is an idea. Can you guys see some? This is a, um, okay. okay, watch this. This is economics. Now, this is early morning brainstorming. Okay, so uh, can everybody see this, Mr. Hammond? Okay, this is this is dealing with economics and something I think is the this is the question of our future, of our present, and that is school choice, especially when you guys have children. Hopefully, this will be where everybody has a has a choice where they get to go to school, high school, let's just say. Now, you guys have had, had a choice. You know, everybody in this country has a choice of where they go to high school, except for certain people. You know who doesn't have a choice? What? Who in the United States has uh, high school students have no choice of where they go to school? That is a choice. Lower income. I already said that. Yeah, what, what, say it again. Lower income. Lower income. The poor people have no choice. 
And that's a, that's really ridiculous. Why, why do why can't like they have a choice of what coffee to have? Of course, you know it's a price thing. But no, what if you are like no? You have to go to the Starbucks. You, no, no, there's no Starbucks. You have to go to the mechanic shop to get get your coffee because that's the only coffee place in your neighborhood. What if they like that? There's no Starbucks. There's no coffee shop where the poor people are. What if they like that? Or there's no Coke machines. There's no Chick Fil A. There's no Walmart. No, no, none of that. You you have to go to that thing that's right there, and it's like the worst prices and the worst quality. That. What? Water yeah, water's free. Yeah, and the water's dirty, by the way, too, in those places. You know, in, in the United States, like where the yeah, that's right. You don't have to live there, but the poor have to live there. Like you can't. You have to put yourself in the shoes of poor people. I know this church is famous for that, and then this is I'm preaching to the choir for a lot of you guys. But look at this from economics. Watch this. For example, here's school. School number one. Just this one. Right. Let's say there's 100 people, 100 students in this school. Okay, broadly speaking, I'm saying that the top 10 people, top 10%, top 10 of the 100, are getting educated at a high school level, 100%. Like everything you need to know, you know, the, the basics, you're, you're, you're well educated on history and science and math, you know, English, you can read and write, you, you can, could go to college if you want to, you could go and work at Chick fil A, nobody's going to have to say, do this? Not educated at all. Something's wrong. You know, so 10 of them are going to be perfectly educated in school number one. The next 10 are very close. Now, if you pass the exam, you're right in here. Like, you're good. You're, like me, like I, 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 finished, I, uh, I finished number 300 in my class out of 327. I was 300. Yeah. Didn't even try. So I was down here like that. I, I passed like totally. I mean, I wasn't, I don't know, maybe they gave it to me or something. I don't remember. But uh, so, anyway, there's a lot of people that pass and they go on. They, you know, they have a graduate, they have a certificate that they pass high school. And then there's people in bad schools who actually 50% and they only learn like half of everything. But they graduate those two school number one, where this is like a poor school. This is a poor school, not poor in money. But it's a poor school. They're not learning. They teach like, I mean, they don't even teach anything about uh, the, the critical parts of our history, the critical parts of math, of the things that you guys are learning. They just, oh, you're not getting it. Well, don't worry about it today. Um, we're going to watch a movie, you know, things like that. And it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a bad school. It's a bad school. Okay, so then putting a number to this, these 10 people are educated at 100%. I think 10 times that, that's 10 to 1. 10 times that, that's not. And I just come up with a, a numerical number just to give it some sort of numeric, numerical value. You understand? This is what you got to do with economics. There's a bonus question, by the way, for you in the next couple of weeks. Is go into the Bible, go into the book of um, uh, Genesis, and it's where Joseph, you know, was a slave and, and, and came came out to be you know, with the dreams of Pharaoh and all that, and he saved Egypt, and he came up with a plan of saving economically the world. And you can go by the Bible and like put that to numbers. This is a, this is a bonus question, bonus extra credit assignment. And you can use the Bible numbers and figures and the words and come up with an actual something like this. Like, how did he do that? How did he save wheat and all this other stuff and cattle and everything? And how did they actually, how did he come out after seven good years and seven bad years? How did he, how did he actually save Egypt? So you would just come up with numbers. So I just came up with some numbers. Okay, so that's worth 65. That old school is producing people, the, you know, like the average or the cumulative average is, that's like, they're like a, it's like a 65%. That school produces students of about 65% level. They should be at 100%, but it's at 65%, right? Which is barely adequate. And I think that's fair to say, that's what's, if you go to Detroit, downtown Birmingham, Atlanta, it's all, it's the same thing. Just about every big city. Okay, but let's say they have a choice. These hundred people have a choice. You can go wherever you want. I predict that out of the, this right here, this is how many would stay. One out of those ten, and one of those, two of those, five of those, five of those, and 46 of these. 
reason why he'll stay, I mean, I don't know the answer to this, this is, but I think the reason why you guys are here, this class, or your other classes um, that you're taking, it's because your parents. It's not you. I mean, you were part of it. You know, they talked to you about it, but they went and said, this is the best place for you. This is going to be this one. You know, this is good for your brother, but this is not going to be good for you. You know, and so your parents are doing this. And that's what's why, that's why this is happening. It's parents. Parents are poor and they're uneducated and they don't have choices because they don't have money. They don't know they have uh, all kinds of bad things that happen to them or they've had bad choices and things. But so then if you give them a choice, those same families that don't really understand education, this is what's going to happen. Most of them or half of them will stay and they will produce this. At one, at 100%, 190, it's okay, that figure. It came out to 32. That's who remains. Now, that's out of a half of it, so it's really comparable to that. Okay, so, but then if you said, let's move to another school, a school that's like, not the best or anything, but a good school, like if they came to this school, or, or went to Estadia, or something like that. This is what happened. These nine who moved, they would get even a better treatment. They would be able to do AP classes. They'd be able to have extra treatment and stuff. So they would actually be, they would be actually be able to excel where they couldn't hear. So if it's excelling, 100% is awesome. You can actually do a little bit more. And these nine would move up. Everybody would be moving up just about. Like, the reason why these are only at 80% is because the classroom, you feel it. They, there's people with knives you. Like, there's a person who brings a knife, and, a, and the policeman comes in and knocks it out of his hand. So that's what's happening in the school. You understand? Know and they're screaming, they're like, no, nah, shut up! Put your daddy, you're stupid! Yeah, that's what's going on in those schools. It's not a school. You know that. You know that, don't you? You know that. If you don't know that, you should know that. And feel sorry for them. And pray for them. But all they need is this. Get out of there. But they can't. You know why? Because they're poor. Oh, so the poor have no choice in our country in education. You know, if you want, if you have a heart attack and you're poor and you got to go to the hospital, you go to any local, any, you can go to Grand, you go to the best one. You're dirt poor, you have nothing. They will treat you and it'll be perfect. You get into the hospital bed and everything, no cost. That's good, right? But education, no, 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 no. Poor. Poor. Hey, poor person. Shut up. You have no choice. And I'm saying this is the this is this is about how to be efficient. What are we trying to do? Why are we educating people? So they'll be educated, so they'll be prosperous, so they can have money, so they can give to people, so they can be, you know, can help other people and our whole overall country will be educated and in good shape, shape right? Right? You see the philosophy. Why? Why do we even do education? You know that. But why? Why should they have a choice? Okay, so if they move, this coefficient is going to go up out of the people here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a steady crowd, which will be 32, and the people who move will be at 38. And you combine that, then that is 70, which is better than 65. If you leave everybody, no choice. Stay in that stupid school. It's 65. Well, allow whoever wants to move, and I just speculated, not everybody's going to move. Half of them won't. No matter how good it is, no matter how, whatever your opportunities, I've just benefited it out. I, maybe half won't even move. And it still improves. 70. So 70 is better than 65. Which system is better? Giving choice? Or no choice. Now you say, Mr. Downey, why don't they know that? They know. It. And that's why some people are cynical about this. Is they know it. And here's the thing. Everybody knows this. Why did in Washington, D.C., which is a really bad inner city for poor people, lots of poor people, really, really bad get to like places. Schools are terrible. It's 
of the population and we see 10%. Thank you. Uh, in our nation's capital. Yeah. So, and it's a, ma it's a major, it's, it's, a, it's a target land, but with, with, with all the government as well. So, so those people, those inner city people, those poor people, what Washington DC has, they have this rule. All these people who want to move to another school, you put your name in a lottery. Hundreds of thousands of families do this. Please put Dan County the chance to move, please. And they draw out 1,000 people every year so that they get to move to the school of their choice. They can move. Those can move, but all the 90% stay you are you cannot and that that is such bigotry that's slavery that's racism that's bad in every single category and yet so everybody knows that people are dying they literally are dying to move but they only allow a thousand well, they allow everybody to get in that lottery you know why they won't let that because they're afraid that everybody would leave they are afraid of improving their lives. They'll leave. It's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed that these this person, these people leave. Some of these, like maybe one of these goes over here and like doesn't make it, like makes S and doesn't like being at the bottom of the class. And so actually wants to go back. There's gonna be like that. But the point is, you have a choice. Everybody in our country has a choice. You can go to private school, you can go to public school, you can do homeschool, you can do no school. I teach some of those. <laughs> Yeah, they're home school, but they're not in no school. They're like, this class, and that's it. <laughs> I can tell. I, I don't think in this class, but there's been people like that. Like, yeah, I'm home school. I mean, and both of his parents were. <laughs> he's like, at home, he's in sixth, seventh grade. <laughs> what does he do? He does online, and like, it's not really. That, that's bad. That, that's worse than that, probably. So, it's safer. You don't get cut. <laughs> You know, get screamed at. It's sad. Okay, do you understand? When you're talking about we're trying to be efficient, what are we trying to do? We're trying to improve the country by educating people on the basics. And these people are not, they're not even on the basics. Now, you have to be from a really famous, motivated family. That's who, you know, who out of the really bad schools, why these 10 are actually doing really well at because their families, maybe their uncle, maybe they're both of their parents, maybe their grandmother is pushing them and saying, do as fast as you can, like you guys are doing. But most of those people, like especially like down here, they don't do any work. It's super sad. And you know why you don't know that? You know why if you don't know that? Because it's hard to find this information. You know why? They don't want you to know. You know why? Because you would say, you would demand this. And if you demand this, they would close this school. That's not a school, it's daycare. And everybody really knows that. And what would you do if you, if you closed that school? Where are they going to go? How about right here? How about, how about you know, this kid? You know, I'm preaching to the crowd, to the, to the choir, you guys. I know you, I know you have to you, But you need to brush up on this. You need to brush up on this. This is a major, basic philosophical thing to be an American. Choice. You should have a choice on Starbucks. You should have a choice where you go to a hospital. You should have a choice on everything. And so it's a basic thing. And the reason why, yeah, that sounds bad. You're going to close that school and where are they going to go? But you know what happened this year? Do you know what happened that year in America? What happened? We had a virus and everything shut down. And where did people go to school? They went online. Oh, oh, they went online. In other words, they didn't have to stay at that stupid school. Oh, and they went online. First of all, there's a lot of cynicism in my comment. They didn't go online. Those people didn't go. They weren't ready to go. Online. They said they were online, 
and they told them the password and whatever to get on. And they clicked on, just so you know, to be cynical. I don't want to teach you to be cynical, but to be open-minded, to understand. You know what they did? When you go, it's like on Google Docs, and I know how long you spent on a document. And you could click on there and say, I'm doing assignment number seven. It clicks on there at 902. And then you go and have some coffee and go jump in the pool. And you come back three hours later, and then you do number one. According to the digital the computer, you spent three hours on number one. <laughs> but you did it, did you? You didn't even do it, it took you 10 seconds. But the computer registers that in three hours. That's how they register schools like this, how much they were online. Is how long you were just online. They were online for eight hours. Those are awesome students and teachers and everything. It is so bogus. Trust me. It's stupid. And so all we need is choice. What this school needs to do is get more efficient. You're going to lose everybody if everybody's cutting. If you have to have policemen that keep order, you allow people to scream at the teacher and throw things and walk out. If you allow that, you're asking for it's going to be bad. So we're going to close it or you improve. Okay, so. One last thing, one last philosophical reason. Here, here is why you're going to talk to people about this one day. Or talk to people you love and they can trust you and tell you even more with them. Your parents and your people that talk to people. There's a, there's a lot of nuances to this. But here's one more thing. The reason why the economics of this is challenged and they won't go along with it. Here is, the, here is the answer, and it's got, a, it's got a real clear rebuttal. And that is this. Why do you not want to deal with this? You know why? What you're going to do is you're going to, you're going to allow a choice. And here's where it comes. Pay attention. If you give them a choice, many are going to move. And who is going to move? Your best students will move. Your best families will move. And that's probably true. If you give everybody a choice, you know who's going to move? The, the ones who are thinking will move. Like, I'm getting burned. What do you, should we do? Move out of the way. <laughs> That's weird, because I was getting burned, now I'm not. <laughs> that, you know, but there's some people who are on drugs, and they're getting burned, but they won't move out of the fire. They're on drugs, and so I'm getting burned. Ah, I burned up. I suffocated. He had a knee on my shoulder and I died. No, like there's other things going on. Okay, but here's the thing. So the reason why, stay with me. I, yeah, that, that, that just went off five minutes early. Watch this. One more thing. One more thing. This is like gold. You can live on this information. You understand? This is going to be with you. And all, not just this, it's all kinds of questions. If we give them a choice, the best people. The best families will move, and I'm pretty sure that's true. If that happens, you know what we're doing? We're sacrificing the ones that stay. Do you agree with me? That's, there's some truth to that. However, there's a greater truth. We are already sacrificing every last one of them by keeping them there. Do you understand? They don't want to change this because you will sacrifice the ones who stay. It'll be so pitiful. They'll be in the, all the best people left. Now we're just all going to be killers. You're already sacrificing 100 of them. You're making, you're sacrificing these people and these people right now, forcing them to go to this stupid place. Do you understand? Remember that, because they will always make you feel bad. Like, yeah, but what about that one person? You can't outlaw abortion, because what happens with that one person who was raped? That's so true. Don't keep it abortion for everybody. Instead of seeing that there's an exception sometimes. Yeah, make an exception. You want to stay? Okay. But don't let people can't leave for the sake of sacrificing. Okay, see you guys later. <laughs> Oh.